Anyway, so welcome to Regenerative Leadership for Sustainable Development. I apologize for the delay, but let's get going. So um, I'd like to go a little bit over the major components of the course to make sure that everybody's familiar with what we're going to be doing over the next four weeks. Uh, and uh, I've been reading your introductions and very impressed with those. The first week is going to be a bit more academic in that I'm going to be giving you some sort of front-loading information about the difference between sustainability, sustainable, sustainable development, and regeneration, which is my work, which I hope you find interesting. Uh, and I always begin with, of course, the value of the Earth Charter. And if you're not familiar with uh, the preamble of the Earth Charter, this is that uh, particular uh, phrase within the Earth Charter, which I also think always think is a great way to sort of frame the conversation over the next four weeks. Now, this course is not about me, it's about you and about what you get out of this to apply to your work. So everything we do and everything you do here is about you and how I can better serve your needs, your interests and your aspirations. And hopefully the bigger conversation of you with your own colleagues and peers in the program and in your own projects, your own work, wherever you work. Uh, so that's the sort of the, the focus here is what I call scenario based learning. It is about you, not about me. And whatever tools I can bring to the table, hopefully it will be useful to you and you can apply them. So with regard to that overview that you've, you've seen on the website, what are the sort of the goals, the major goals of the course? One is for you to be able to develop yourselves further from what I've seen from your resumes you're all quite professional already uh, and experts in areas of environmental work, uh, in community work, in nonprofit work, in governmental um, uh, projects or programs and campaigns and education. So what we're looking for here is actually to how do we expand uh, the work that you are doing through the work that we're doing here in order to be able to become what I call, or we call sustainability or regenerative change agency leaders. And of course, to be able to speak intelligently about the principles of sustainability and how to differentiate sustainability from sustainable development and what is different about regeneration. Uh, and then from this understanding to be able to apply this, these theories or these frameworks to your own work. And of course, next week we'll be covering specifically the regenerative leadership framework, uh, which is based on my research and consulting work uh, in my own field <clears throat> in leadership. And so, of course, in the end, you'll be able to use all of this to apply to your own communities, your own programs, projects, initiatives, etc. So the requirements of the course is that one of these two are required for the certificate. If you're doing the diploma for, uh, social, in social innovation, one of these two are required. I recommend that you do both. I've already received some of these uh, in terms of the self-assessment that's actually posted in uh, the introduction to the course. It's also posted at the end of week one in the course online. Uh, so you, the idea about, of the self-assessment is that you complete this questionnaire for yourself and then at the end you'll see a table where you can actually set out your own personal goals with regard to the self-assessment you've run on yourself in order to make your own action plan about how you want to become a better leader uh, going forward then the idea is that the table that you create you can share with me and i'll be glad to provide feedback but it, this is not a static document. As we go through the course, you probably go back to the uh, table and actually update it and improve it as we go changing uh, over to other frameworks and other leadership tools and skills. Then the other requirement, and this is the, probably the more important requirement, is that you create your own uh, project, which I call a regenerative solution, which can be applied using the regenerative leadership framework and other tools that we'll be looking at this, these four modules to your own work, to expand what you're doing environmentally or socially or economically in terms of well-being, to actually enrich that work 
by creating a project and you will see that project also posted at the end of week one where you have the outline that you can begin to fill in and again share with me as you wish uh, and I'll be glad to provide some feedback or what Marshall Goldsman calls feed, feed forward uh, rather than feedback. The other optional weekly assignments of course are participating in the weekly forum. Some of you are very busy, you might not have time, uh, but I encourage you to participate in the forum because it is a very valuable place where you can continue the conversation, not just with me, but with each other. So I strongly recommend that. And the reflective journals, this is, uh, I set a question every week based on the material we cover for you to reflect on uh, personally about how these ideas are shaping your own thinking as a leader uh, and as somebody involved already in some of this work. And the reflective journal is something you share only with me and so we can have a more of a private conversation based on your writings. And again, I strongly encourage you to do this uh, each week, but again, this is optional and not required. So the first question I always ask and you can think about this, or since there are so few of you, if you want to actually jump on the chat, uh, onto audio and actually share with me, uh, one is obviously both in Costa Rica at this moment. Um, and the question I have for you is, what do you think is the most important environmental, social, and or economic local problem your community is facing today? What do you think, Flor or Luis? Any thoughts? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, what do you think? Yeah, I will. I'm, I will put again the. I was trying to see if the video uh, allow me to connect better or not. Um, in terms of Costa Rica, um, I see several several trends that um, should be attended. Um, Costa Rica used to be a very balanced society in terms of uh, more equality. I see a, right now a trend of inequality in terms of uh, rich and poor, uh, in terms of, of material um, uh, prosperity, and um, in, in the whole population. And I feel it's getting also, it's it's getting it's a challenge because of another trend that is happening not only in Costa Rica but around the world that is migration, mm -hmm. migration of populations from from other parts of for, from other countries. Um, we have a, a, a significant population of Nicaraguans, Colombians, Venezuelans. Oh. And people from Cuba that cross the country going to to Mexico, mm. that is uh, very relevant uh, at this moment to to. And we, in my opinion, <clears throat> as I was saying in 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 the reflection what I wrote, for me this is a a challenge. It, this is not a problem. This is a a problem of populations again population. This is. For me, this is a humanitarian, we should see this as a, in terms of a humanitarian, um, how, how we can help our um, friends, uh, how we can uh, help other people that are in problem, that are facing challenges in their lives because in uh, the in the country where they live, the conditions are not they're mm. not having good conditions. So the, the the problem is that usually this uh, the population face this Costa Ricans against Nicaraguans. Oh, this is a problem. They're coming to to take our jobs, or their uh, burglars are coming. This is a very wrong approach, in my opinion, and. Uh, we shouldn't follow that approach. When okay. well, we I, I'm going to cut you off because we don't have very much time. I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no yeah. please. That, that is a very sort of brief. So you've already framed the problem. Uh, Flor, do you have any thoughts? Um, 
very similar Guatemala problem, big problem is inequality also and corruption all over the system. Okay. Uh, so that increases poverty, which causes uh, migration for Guatemalans to migrate is more about poverty and, and not opportunity. So a similar kind of problem. Similar. So in the environmental mm -hmm. gets harmed because we have so many structural problems that nobody is paying attention. No people doesn't have the energy. Like we don't, right. we cannot take care of our people. Right. So now my, uh, the jungle is burning for weeks. And yesterday Notre Dame was burning and many Guatemalans were like, oh, Notre Dame. And I'm sorry, I, I went there and I'm, it hurts to see. But right. our jungle burns every day by right. a kilometers and that's okay so is it I don't, I don't think is anybody else on the line is there no no May so, but the big question here is yes these are important problems however what is the underlying cause of this problem because these problems are so complex that we find it very hard to address them to resolve them because we don't know, we don't really understand what the underlying cause of the problem is. And the, the, very briefly, what do you think is the underlying cause of all of this? One word or two words? Principles. Okay. We are very behind and overwhelmed. <laughs> This is, this, is a, this is very important, and this is the basis of the whole work we're going to be doing this four weeks. Yeah. Is everything that you've mentioned, and any other problem that you can come up with, is created from somewhere. That somewhere is human consciousness. You, you, you see, the, how, how we see the world is how we operate in it. So corruption is an extension of how we see the world, how we operate in it. Migration is a re result of violence or corruption or greed or fear or anger uh, or distrust. All of these emerge from human consciousness. One of the problems, major problems we have in education, in government, in society, in business, is that instead of focusing on who we are, we focus on what we do. And the problem is we can't solve the problems until we change who we are. And that is a huge challenge. That is the most difficult challenge of all. We cannot have peace, as the Dalai Lama says, until there is peace in our hearts. We can't have reconciliation and conversations and dialogue until we can actually listen to each other. And that will be the basis of the work we're going to be doing next week which goes beyond sustainability and sustainable development into regeneration. And, and that will become clear as we go along, okay? So, and it's ha sometimes hard for people who are very concrete and rational to talk about consciousness. So I'm not talking about consciousness as mystical or uh, even as ethical. I'm talking about this is how we see the world. This is how our behaviors are driven by how we see the world, by what we believe, by, as, as we used to say, by our principles. If our principles are totally different, then these are a layer above our consciousness. We have created something artificial, which is not pure consciousness, that is something else. And that's where we begin to disconnect from each other. But we'll get back to that. So you're probably familiar with things like this, what's been happening over the last 60 years the great human acceleration in everything that we do and the impact this has had in the world, which is creating an unsustainable world, whether economically, socially, or environmentally, and of course, in our well-being. In order to be able to understand these, we need to define some of the terms. So that some of the terms that we'll be talking about, and that we, of, of course, with reference to the United Nations, is the sustainable development term or notion which came into existence really in the 1980s, 1987 particularly. And the idea of sustainable development as a process, whereas sustainability is this sort of end goal. This is where we want to get to, but it's a static thing. Uh, 
once we get to sustainability, people like me are no longer necessary or people who do sustainability work. Like if we all got along well, we wouldn't need lawyers. Or if we're all healthy, we wouldn't need doctors. So sustainability practitioners are somebody that should not exist. So the idea here is to be able to differentiate between a process, which is how we are going towards that ideal future, where we can see that everything is in harmony and balance and everybody has access to education, Guatemalans and Nicaraguans go back to their place because that's where they thrive. Uh, and Costa Rica is a beautiful country, again, uh, that lives in harmony and balance. So this all comes back down from the sustainable uh, report, the, the Gruntland report in 1987, where they define sustainable development rather than sustainability. This often quoted phrase of sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This is something that people quote a lot, particularly in the United Nations, but they all always or very often miss out the two different components, the other elements of this quote, which is this is the first time that the United Nations actually brings together the idea of environment and the needs of the poor. And the idea that the planet is limited in the resources it has to actually help us all thrive as a world or a global community and society. So uh, the PowerPoint, when I share it, which is difficult because it's too large at the moment, you will have the links uh, to be able to follow these documents. So what I'm going to be doing here is just giving a very brief overview of some of these concepts. As you may be familiar with uh, in sustainability, of course, John Elkington in the 90s coined the term the triple bottom line, which is how we bring together and reconcile the natural environment, the economic environment, and the social environment. Many people focus on one or two of these to the detriment of the other. In order to become sustainable, we must consider the environmental and economic impacts of our social work or the social impacts of our environmental and our economic work. So all of these three must be reconciled if we are to reach this, the sweet spot of sustainability. And all of these are only the legs of a stool, which is human well-being and obviously planetary well-being, which is the end goal of sustainability. None of these three is actually the end goal. More recently, people like Peter Senge and his colleagues have brought out other frameworks where they actually place the economy at the center, which drives everything we do. And so, of course, the economy is embedded in society, but society is embedded in the natural environment. So the nested model here uh, from the work of Senge and his collaborators in 2009 is a more current model that people use, and that's gone into, and you see Kate Rayworth's work in the donut, uh, which is also posted on the uh, website. So there are other readings like the Bellagio principles that you can see on the website in order to go deeper into definitions and principles of sustainability. <laughs> I define regeneration from my research as our capacity to restore first the damage caused by human activity on natural social and economic systems, at the same time securing lasting desirable futures for all living beings through the design of integrated approaches that lead to resilient, thriving, and life-affirming organizations, communities, regions, and the world. So that's the definition of regeneration. And it is different from sustainable development and sustainability in that regenerative practice begins by focusing on human consciousness rather than behaviors. And that's the work we'll be doing next week. And you will see how we can unpack consciousness as leadership. So what I've coined in terms of regeneration is that instead of looking at the triple bottom line, I have, we suggest, some of us suggest the triple top line, which is a more aspirational vision. And that particular vision is actually defined as how can we grow prosperity, celebrate community, and enhance the health of all species for all time. That's all we need to do. That makes sense? So this very broad statement is an umbrella under which we can place many other things. Yes, Rob, go ahead. So 
uh, I'm connecting this with uh, my work with indigenous leaders sure. uh, and what they call el buen vivir, you know, the right. well-being. And it's this in, uh, uh, concept of the whole, right? And it's for everybody. Absolutely. And it really embraces all this concept of the three uh, areas or mm -hmm. dimensions. And it's uh, powerful to see how the originary people uh, have this uh, wisdom yep. that now we are just like going back to it. We are going back to the principles of the consciousness that actually have allowed humanity to thrive for thousands of years with some mistakes along the way, which we could talk about, where people are actually saturated or overrun the capacity of where they lived to survive, uh, such as uh, the Mayas, uh, the Mayans, or I mean other Central American populations, or even South American populations, or the Sumerians who created agriculture and salted the earth by not understanding things like capillarity uh, and actually killed the land. So it's been happening again and again and again. If this is the first time in history that we are at risk of a mega extinction as a species created by us. So we do need to go back to the principles again, as we mentioned of indigenous wisdom. So we will talk about things like the Iroquois Indians and seventh generations, and of course the systems thinking that underlines this wisdom. But we'll, we'll get back to that more next week. Yes, go ahead, Luis. I, 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 since I heard the, the concept of regeneration, mm -hmm. been related that with this um, analogy that we use to help people. When we see someone in need, um, there is this approach of uh, assistance when we give someone the fish. Right. We, we always try to say, no, we, it's better if we go uh, another step and we uh, allow this person, we, we train him how to fish so mm -hmm. that he, makes, he can get his own fish. For me, regeneration is a step further when we uh, safeguard and conserve and protect or re regenerate the ecosystem when he gets his fish because it is, if he has no fish, he will not survive. So I, right. me, this is like a, a continuation of this process. So we need to, to protect this ecosystem so that this individual that is creating this capacity has the, the possibility to continue fishing. Yeah, this, is a, this is an excellent point. Uh, I don't know if you know the Ashoka Institute in Washington and Bill Drayton he actually uses that same metaphor and he says, it's no longer enough to give a fish or to teach to fish, we have to reinvent the fishing industry. <laughs> yeah. It's not enough, as you say, and regeneration is going beyond sustainability into rethinking everything that we do. We need to redesign everything that we do. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk to that, we'll talk about that more as we go through the course, as you'll see. So one of the very important things about regenerative leadership is the shift in how we speak about sustainability. One of the, the people who have made it very difficult to speak about sustainability is, is um, Al Gore, unfortunately. Al Gore speaks very much on this side of uh, the tone as a leader about the risks, about the the fear about the dangers of sustainability. Unfortunately, the risks are real. However, as a leader, it is our responsibility to inspire people to want to do things, not to do them because if not, the consequences are going to be catastrophic. So in terms of our tone, the proposal here is for us to shift from sustainable tone to regenerative tone, to go from telling people to be responsible to inspire people to want to go beyond what they're doing today. Not to feel obliged, but to feel, and I think, Luis, you're going in that direction, that all of these problems are opportunities for us to improve and beautify and make better, not to solve a problem, but to generate 
real solutions with others in a personal way, not an organizational way. What can I do? Not what do other people need to do? What has the government not done? Or the corporations not doing, done? What can I do? What is, what is possible rather we have scarce resources? No, that's a lie. There are enough resources to solve all these problems. We just have to find the consciousness to be able to make that work. And global issues, as you bring up, for example, you talk about migration uh, and maybe climate refugees or economic refugees or political or violence refugees. All of these are global issues that cannot be solved unless we become passionate individually and solve something locally. And we'll be talking more about that next week as well. How can we move away from respect to love? Consciousness in the universe it's not about respect, it's love. The physical universe actually moves and works in a series of ultra um, frequencies, of high, very high, high frequencies, that when they work perfectly, there is nothing which we call entropy. There is no friction. When there is no friction, this is what I call socially zero entropy, is where love is operating. Where our behaviors are coming from that consciousness which actually accepts and embraces everybody and everything, not differentiates and disconnects. And that is more than respect. That is a profound connection to everything that lives. And do we have, rather than hope for the future, do we have faith in one, in ourselves and in other people? Or do we respond in distrust? This shift in consciousness is fundamental in order for us to generate dialogue. And we'll get, get into more of that next week as well. So another very important framework that you may be aware of or not is the natural step, <clears throat> which is created by Carl Henrik Robert, an oncologist in Sweden in the 1980s and 90s, which he discovered that env environmental issues were actually affecting people with terminal diseases. So the environmental impacts of certain concentrations of toxic substances in certain regions of Sweden were causing cancer, which led him to actually get engaged in sustainability work. And in his consulting process with the country, uh, which led to the natural step, he designed these four conditions for a sustainable society. And these are what he says, uh, in a sustainable society, nature is not subject to systematically increasing Concentrations of substances from the Earth's crust, concentrations of substances produced by society. So the things that we extract, like heavy metals that poison the water and the Earth, the when the ones that we use and then discard and poison the Earth, including phosphor um, fertilizers and, and, uh, <clears throat> and fertilizers, then degrading the natural environment by mechanical means, such as creating canals where there are rivers and ruining the ecosystem, something that Costa Rica is quite good at, by the way. We can talk about that later. And then finally, that we should not and cannot create conditions for all people on earth that actually do not allow them to thrive. These are the four conditions of the natural step. And you can come back to this uh, later, and obviously you can follow the, uh, the link or actually go there whenever you want. So moving on, I have created, and this one I've trot through very quickly as well, what I call a sustainability fractal. Are you familiar with fractals? Like parts? The, the yes, we can subdivide the universe from the microscopic to the macroscopic from the, the structure of the atom and the nucleus and even smaller all the way up to how galaxies and the universe operate. All of these are actually following mathematical rules uh, and physics rules that actually keep everything in this electromagnetic frequency and relationship that allows everything to live in what we call the physical universe. And consciousness, as we will see, is actually one element that emerges from that universe. In a fractal, when we talk about sustainability, we can actually design it in this way, as a fractal. So here you see the fractals, 
and of course the triple bottom line of ecology, economics, and economics and equity. Most people actually focus on one of these three, and that's where we get the single bottom line, such as the profit motive in business. And so ecologists or environmentalists actually ask the question, are we obeying nature's laws? And they work looking at these frameworks. This is what actually, the context of where they work, actually look at these kinds of principles. Whereas equity looks at, do people respect one another? And their themes are these. Let me move this out of the way. So they look at social justice, free trade, and exploitation. So they actually have this critical perspective of society. Obviously, in economics, we look at how can I create my product, my service at the greatest possible profit? And these are some of the frameworks from which these principles of economy and economics actually emerge. So free market capitalism, for example, or shareholder management. And we'll be looking at different frameworks. When people begin to realize that the consequences of following that single bottom line doesn't work, they begin to actually be uh, reconcile maybe two bottom lines. So they get this double bottom line. But they begin to act, ask questions like, is our ecological strategy profitable? And so companies go from cradle to grave concepts to begin to doing things like recycling and reducing and efficiency. And they begin to green the business by buying green products or creating green products. Then they go to cradle to cradle, which is that integrated cycle. Uh, and we'll be talking about Bill McDonough later, uh, who wrote Cradle to Cradle, <clears throat> about the chemistry of humanity uh, and how we can actually do a, a sustainable cycle both in the technological as well as in the natural. That brings in industrial re-evolution and finally eco-effectiveness and upcycling versus eco-efficiency and recycling. On the other hand, if we look at ecology and equity, we ask how is this product or service going to affect future generations? And so we begin to look at toxic products and substances in the environment where we work. Uh, we begin to design more beautiful buildings sustainably and eventually look at social health and well-being. And at the bottom here, if we look at equity not economics, we say, are men and women pay it, paid fairly and equally? So we look at gender equity. We begin to look at corporate social responsibility and stakeholder management, those who are suffering the effects, the impacts of our industry and our work, rather than just the shareholders who have an economic interest and who have power to make us uh, change our decisions necessarily, not necessarily for the better. So this is one simple uh, fractal that allows us to look at that sweet spot by reconciling all these different positions. So as we move on further, of course, we have the UN, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are now 17 uh, and which go to 2030. And anything we do can be connected to the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and hopefully bringing in all of these will actually allow us to create our regenerative project in a way that will be regenerative rather than just sustainability with a very narrow focus. So <clears throat> as you go from the global to the local, of course, we need to go back to from the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, what do I do in my backyard? What's my project? What is my program? What can I do that brings all of this together to improve the quality of life for everybody and everything where I am, and then to grow that into something bigger? That's my recommendation as we go forward. And so there's some of these things here uh, that I share, and I'll try to share this with you via email so you can get the full PowerPoint with the links and you, you can explore these. So, oh, I'm actually, I'm gonna have to interrupt for a minute. I actually, I'm moving to Vermont next week. Uh, so I, they're bringing in the boxes for my mover, for, for the move, for the movers. So I have to open the garage door that I'll be right back, okay? Give me just two minutes, it'll be very quick. Meanwhile, let me uh, stop recording. Let me 
assuming we are recording here. Well, anyway, I'll be right back. Give me a second. ¿Cómo está, Flor? Bien, ¿y tú? Bien, mucho gusto. Igualmente. ¿Estás en San José? Estoy en San José, sí. Ah, bueno. Qué bonito. Es, sí. Este... Sorry about that. Ah, qué rápido regresó. Qué you rápido estaba platicando. No fue tan malo. No, no, my wife is that back. was very fast. What's that? That was very fast. Yeah, no, my, my wife is back, so she's... she's <laughs> Um, for some reason, let me see. Okay. I just wanted to go over. Why is it doing this? Oh, here we go. So, um, just to go over what we covered this morning uh, and in the course of the, the, this week for you to actually read up, I very strongly recommend watching the Alex Steffen video, uh, which is in week one. I've posted my book, the first chapter, which actually is in the introduction. Next, we will be getting into the regenerative leadership framework, which is in chapter two of the book. So that's posted there. There are other materials there. Uh, I've already mentioned about writing a reflection or joining the forum. Here are the questions that are posted there on the website. And um, obviously at any time you, you can email me with your questions. If you're thinking about your project or if you are struggling with creating your uh, personal leadership action plan, just feel free to email me. And for next week then, if you can, if you have time, do read chapter two of Leading for Regeneration in the, uh, I'll open up the link to week two very soon. Uh, there's a car, there's a, a video, a TED talk by Majora Carter, if you haven't seen her. She is a very important sustainability leader and regenerative leader working in underprivileged, <clears throat> in an underprivileged uh, community in the South Bronx of New York. So how to work in vulnerable communities, which clearly if you're talking about migration is important. Uh, and there are other lots of resources. So, let me see if we can, ah, there you are. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop recording if I can. And um, we can just get, start talking about a couple of things uh, before we go away. If I can stop the recording. Or not. I've actually got, this is apparently it's been recorded in two places. I have to check the recording, make sure if necessary, I'll just do the recording all over again. So do you have any questions or thoughts or suggestions at this time? Um, I found very interesting, I'm sorry. No, no, you're fine, we can hear you. Ladies first, maybe I think Flor want to say something. Okay. Go, go ahead, Luis. Okay, I'm or go ahead, Flor, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised uh, because I was not ex expecting a kind of this tone in the in for the course, and uh, very happy with it. Very happy because uh, this uh, awakeness of conscience—that's uh, what I, I feel like it's been calling me for a long time, and mm -hmm. strongly as ever this late, uh, this past few years right. uh, and how to connect everything like social, uh, environmental and also right. our own need to, to survive in a real economic world. So right. I'm really happy and, and impressed right. by... It, it is important for mind. people to recognize that there, this intuitive voice inside us is important. Uh, and quite often we suppress that because we don't know how to bring this out and share it particularly is what I call the tree hugger meeting with the CEO or the C-suite in the boardroom. How do you talk about this stuff to people for whom the only thing that is important is 
profit mm -hmm. or solving the problems of the people of the world's poor how do you talk about consciousness with somebody say look they're dying how do you talk about consciousness when there is so much urgency well unfortunately we do have to find a way to have that conversation otherwise everything we do is band-aids is curitas we give water, we give food, we give them tents, uh, we give them vaccinations, uh, but we don't create a society which actually can, where people can thrive and bring themselves out of poverty and create governments for themselves and be autonomous and be educated and, and have opportunity to actually dream of a life for themselves with help from other people, maybe who have a few more tools, maybe like us, who can help them become themselves, not who tell them what to do and how to, how to live. And that, that's a tricky thing to do. People very often can't actually, and we'll talk about that later, about how do we actually remove ourselves from the equation. Go ahead, Luis. No, I, I was thinking uh, in one of these slides that you were introducing to us related to sustainability mm -hmm. and regeneration and this move that you were encouraged us to, to, to do. Um, I have to reflect a little bit more about that. Um, mm -hmm. I found it interesting, but um, what... Um, uh, the way I started seeing that is that uh, this is from a systemic point of view, like we were concentrated just maybe on one perspective uh, on, on, on reality and we should uh, brighten our observation to go into other areas so that we have another perspective and a clearer and wider uh, observation of reality. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the message that I got with, with this introduction and what, what... This is very important. When you look at the Regenerative Project outline, all of this comes in. You will see that in the outline, I will be asking you, well, if you're thinking about, for example, helping uh, people coming into Costa Rica from abroad, and you're going to work with these people. Well, what are the social, economic, and environmental challenges? But in the end, the three, these three legs of the stool are only about how can you help them create their own well-being for themselves? And that, that is the challenge, because we believe sometimes that we know how to do this and we override people's dreams and aspirations for themselves. And that, that is oppression, even if it's disguised as philanthropy or positive social work, it actually is invading other people's culture and belief systems because you don't know what to do because you're inferior in a sense, because you have not been able to be successful. So I know better. These are the tools for you to become better. Uh, and unfortunately, that is sometimes a prejudice or bias that we find very hard to actually get rid of. And it actually contaminates how we speak with each other. And when we, when we communicate that bias, other people immediately disconnect from us. They don't want to be with us. They will take our stuff, and this is one of the problems of the United Nations and things like USAID, uh, these big, uh, and the Red Cross, they bring help and we create dependency on people who no longer actually know how to work for themselves. They depend and they expect us to solve the problems for them. And that becomes this vicious cycle, which we can never break out of because we have not even helped other people. We don't empower other people. We help other people empower themselves. So as a leader, my job is not to tell you, hey, if you do this, you're gonna be great. It's what can I do for you that I can help with so that you can become yourself. Otherwise, my consciousness is actually becoming a parasite of your consciousness and I'm invading your free will 
and not allowing you to actually exercise your own free will. Yes, you are in very, very dire and difficult circumstances. So maybe you can't do it for yourself right now. But with just a little bit of help, you will be able to do fine. This is what uh, Jeffrey Sachs called the, the bottom rung of poverty. People below the bottom rung of poverty on the ladder of poverty, they cannot help themselves. But once they get onto that first rung of poverty, above poverty, then they can begin to create their own lives. And we have to be very careful about that. Anyway, I have to go, and I'm sure you do too. So I'll check out the recording. If it didn't work, I'll record it again. I'll make a shorter video uh, and get every materials out. In the meantime, if you want to connect with me, just email me at any time. If you want to set up a Zoom call individually, we can do that as well. We can schedule an appointment. All right? Thank you very much. Wonderful. It was a pleasure. Muchas gracias. Que esté muy bien. Saludos, Flor. Saludos. Hasta luego.